Dear visitors, dear listeners, online viewers, my name is Marco Zaitz. I'm those who don't know me. I'm the head of the political history research program at the Institute of Contemporary History, this institution, and of course, one of the organizers of the History on the Edge, Zgudovina Nashpici um, lecture series. Um, so, welcome, welcome to the new History on the Edge lecture series in the season. 2022-2023. Um, maybe for you who don't know, why the name? Why is Gudovina na Spitzi, History on the Edge? Actually, uh, Spitza, the Edge, is a part of Ljubljana, here in Prule, where the Ljubljanica River meets the Gruber Channel. So the Institute of Contemporary History, Institut za Novatius Gudovino, is nearby. So we couldn't help but play with words and Fun fact, until 1957, Spitza was the town's bathing area, so on, on the Ljubljanica River. And um, unfortunately, the river became too polluted for swimming. But maybe again one day, until then, we can use the, the name for our lecture series. Um, about the series, this year, History on the Edge, Zgudvina na Spitzi, will not be only in the domain of the Political History Research Program, but all research programs at the Institute will participate in the organization. Uh, I will mention the Economic, Social and Environmental History program, as well as Digital Humanities program. And of course, I need to mention our um, research infrastructure program. Without this, uh, uh, we couldn't be able to give the lecture Old, uh, without uh, organization and without technical support, it wouldn't be possible. So thank you for them too. Um, in this year's lecture season, most of the lecturers will be visiting fellows at the Institute. Um, the Institute of Contemporary History in Ljubljana has recently launched a visiting fellowship program. So I can only say that we are happy to host international researchers with interesting topics, and new conceptual approaches. In this way, I think the history of Slovenia is spontaneous, spontaneously integrated into wider global historiography. So today's speakers, I think, is a good example of this. And I will try to, in a couple of sentences, to present our first speaker of the of days uh, of this uh, this season series. Cody James Inglis is a doctoral candidate in comparative history at Central European University in Budapest and Vienna and junior researcher on the European Research Council Consolidator Grant, Negotiating Post-Imperial Transitions, hosted at the Institute of Political History in Budapest. His research interests include intellectual history and the history of political thought, the history of concepts, the history of historiography, regionally focused on the Habsburg Empire and its successor states in Central and Southeastern Europe from 1848 to till 1948, in very interesting time span of uh, 100 years. But last but not least, Cody James Inglis is a visiting fellow at our institution, Institute of Contemporary History in Ljubljana, from October till November 2022. So these are his last days at our <laughs> institution. I hope yeah. not really the last yeah, days. Yeah, that that you, will, you will come back <laughs> in, on, on some other occasion and we are counting on that. And today he will present the paper entitled The Republican Left in the New Dean Europe, Com Comparative History of Political Thought. I will not present much of his, from his abstract. I, I will let the author and the speaker himself to present his work. Maybe, maybe it's just worth stating that uh, our speaker will provide an overview of his dissertation project, which re-examines republicanism as one of the key political theoretical foundation of radical democratic thought in the late Habsburg uh, Empire and its successor states, score uh, in a space called the Nubian Europe. 
Repub republicanism is not particularly visible as a tradition of political thought in this part of Europe, largely because it was overshadowed by other more he hegemonic ideologies. I will stop now and I will mm -hmm. let the, our guest speak. Super. Thank you. Hvala za uvod. <laughs> Hvala lepo. Um, so, uh, here's the title of the presentation. Uh, and Marco just said a few words from my abstract, so I'll jump right in. In 1907, Anton Kristan, a member of the Yugoslav Social Democratic Party, an editor living in Idria, then located in the Duchy of Carniola, Austria-Hungary, wrote a series of articles published in the Prague-based journal Studenski Zbornik about socialism and its positions on various contemporary questions, on private property, the property of peasants, the final goal of socialism, nationality, world peace, schooling, the Catholic Church, women, marriage, and the intelligentsia. The same year, the articles were collected and published under the title Socialism by the organ of the Yugoslav Social Democratic Party, NAPRE. It's titled the Slovene Language Translation of the Leading Social Democratic Daily in Europe, Forwärts, edited by Karl Kautsky. Leading, leading into the exploration of these questions, Kristan gave a basic outline of socialism in a few sentences. Socialism has economic, ethical, philanthropic, and political sides. In politics, the ideal of socialism is the republic. In everyday life, the ideal of socialists is the introduction of philanthropy, and in economic terms, the fight against capitalism and the introduction of common property, what he called skupna vasnina, that is, communism. <laughs> While the style of the text is didactic, and as a result, rather simplistic and formulaic, this opening passage is fascinating from the history of an all too understudied frame of modern political thought in this part of Europe, republicanism. Here, Christen ties a vision of republican state form to a particular civic ethos in private life, namely philanthropy, as well as to the organization of social and economic reproduction on the basis of common property, uh, what he calls skupna lastina, and which points toward communism. While Christen identified this conceptual triad as the core of socialist ideology in general, we can recognize similar conceptual arrangements at the core of some adjacent ideological frameworks, particularly on the political left. Uh, shared across different linguistic contexts in this part of Europe. Part of this was the result of an intra-imperial transmission of political ideas which grew in intensity through the 19th century within the Habsburg Empire, and which experienced an unmatched density through the 1880s, 90s, at the turn of the century, and into the early 1910s. The facts that common visions of and struggles for the democratization of political and economic life as well as the incubation of a philanthropic civic ethos in the daily habitus of individual citizens, were shared across ideologies on the political left is, in large part, the result of the circulation of intellectuals with similar political affinities through the same academic and intellectual centers. This is not to say that these developments were the result of intellectual autarky within the empire. Republican thinkers, whether socialists or communists, agrarians, civic radicals, or left liberals, took many different models of existent Republican states into account. And in part, this was due to their movement through different centers of intellectual life outside of the empire too. The preference for looking at the French and Swiss cases, for example, among Serbian liberal and socialist Republicans was due in part to generational experiences of either studying abroad in Paris or Zurich or being embedded within culturally Francophile subcurrents at home. Comparative visions of the American federal Republican experiment, with all of its dysfunctions, contradictions, and oppression, were informed by on-the-ground experiences of those who lived there temporarily or permanently. Experiences of direct repression could also inform the shape of Republican political thought. The Hungarian linguistic context is particularly instructive here. The beheading of the leaders of the Hungarian Jacobin movement in 1795 and the marginalization of Republican politics from the aftermath of the revolutions of 1848-49 up through the collapse of the Habsburg imperial framework at the end of 1918, deeply radicalized the workers and civic radical movements against existent structures of royal and noble privilege. 
The declarations of Republican polities in November 1918 and March 1919 on the former territory of the Kingdom of Hungary are in part a testament to the clear Republican ideas that had been formulated in entangled left-wing political milieu from the latter half of the 19th century through to the end of the First World War and the collapse of the Habsburg Empire. The interwar Austrian case, by contrast, is an example of how Republican ideas could also be articulated in a much less radical fashion, namely around the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Austria, and even provide the founding theoretical elements for the state's Republican constitution, written by the jurist Hans Kelsen. Rather than a populistic, oppositional, or activistic republicanism then, we also have cases in the region which point rather toward legalistic forms of Republican thought. To this end, both comparison and the assessment of regional and continental entanglements are key to writing this history. In what follows, I do not aim for completeness nor a thorough treatment of every text. Many obvious elements are put to the side artificially, if only for the sake of time, and to provide a more general overview of my research and argument. So we'll get back to the primary sources. Returning to the year 1907, a group of university students in Belgrade began to publish a newspaper and theoretical journal under the title Republica. They wrote regular articles arguing for a radical Republican restructuring of all aspects of Serbian public and private life. Inspired above all by the institutions and political ethos of the French Third Republic, the mental world of these students was also clearly influenced by the progressive wing of the Serbian intellectual scene. Members of this group were based particularly in Belgrade, many of whom were politically camped around the Independent Radical Party, which was a left-wing split from Nikola Pashic's People's Radical Party, led by the scholar Ljubomir Stojanovic, and whose members or sympathetic fellow travelers variously included Yasha Prodanovic, Milan Grol, Jovan Skelic, Jovan Svic, and Jovan Juljevic, among others. These were keen members of the Serbian Literary Society, Srpska Kniževna Zadruga, and members who published, uh, and writers who published in the Serbian Literary Review, a Srpska Kniževna Glasnik as well as recognized professors at the University of Belgrade and members of the Royal Serbian Academy of Sciences. Far from endorsing the political developments in their country, these were critical intellectuals and remained so for the duration of their respective careers. For the radical students, who remained largely anonymous on the pages of the Publica, a broad swath of problems had emerged within Serbian society and the Serbian state that required solutions. To them, religion had no place in public schools, and censorship had no place in the mental life of the reading public. Claims of free elections made by the government were judged in the harshest terms as patently false. And while the revised Serbian constitution of 1903 was quite liberal in some of its provisions, the lack of universal equal suffrage and restrictions on the press were met with the ire of the paper. Indeed, the authors of Republica's editorials also addressed one of the main political questions of the day, the potential for a future South Slavic state. In April 1909, the editors of the paper printed a short article on the topic, arguing for a, quote, free union of Serbs and Croats. Uh, they wrote, it is the duty of all sober discerning Croatian Serbian politicians to liberate themselves from historical and state legal prejudices, to liberate themselves from the tradition of Dushan's and Zvonimir's empires, to abandon remarks and illusions about a Yugoslav empire and who its emperor would be, and to lead the fight on all fronts on the realistic basis of modern and revolutionary democracy. Let it be ours. Without the Belgrade and Setinje courts, against the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and for a union of free Croats and Serbs. The eschewing of historical and state legal prejudices and the rejection of the image of medieval South Slavic despotates was in fact a rejection of the nationalist political imaginaries of the leading Serbian, Serbian and Croatian political camps. They stood clearly against the prevailing idea of extending the Serbian state as a sort of Balkan Piedmont to include the rest of the South Slavs. For this was mere Serbian national chauvinism wrapped in the language of national or anthropological unity. But they also implicitly argued against the trialist solution proposed by various South Slavic politicians in Vienna. This was nothing more than an extension of aggressive Austro-Hungarian political and economic imperialism, which just the year previous, 1908, had annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina on completely undemocratic and militarist terms. To the north of the Sa Sava-Danube confluence in the Kingdom of Hungary, Modern Republican political thought was also articulated largely in the 1910s by those around the left wing of the 48er Independence Party. This is the Nedvin Nocash Fugit Lenshegi Party. On the left wing of the party, a progressive intellectual milieu took the 1848-49 Kosciutian Republican legacy and to a lesser extent that of the radical Mihai Tancic as its own. 
Without going too deeply into the political and institutional history of the 48ers, a split from the left wing of the party occurred in the early 1910s around George Nantes, this is him, uh, who subsequently founded the countrywide Republican Party, and published his theoretical journal, The Hungarian Republic, published in Hodmezo Vashahei, near Seged. The party itself was not terribly influential in its short existence, although it had ties to many of the main progressive intellectuals in Budapest. The poets Andrei Adi and Attila Jozef, the sociologist and political thinker Oskar Yassi, the liberal socialist and civic radicals around the journals Nyugat and Husserik Sazad, as well as some connections to the Hungarian workers' movement concentrated on the Hungarian Social Democratic Party. The Republican Party's main contribution to oppositional political life was to question the very basis of monarchic authority in Hungary, and by extension in the Habsburg domains as a whole. One of the party's main figures, Antal Kalmar, published a text to this end in 1912, entitled Republican Sovereignty. There, Kalmar argued that in a republican form of state, the nation is always in possession of the supreme will of the state, of the sumum imperium, over which no other power presides. Ultimately, in terms of political theory, this also means that since there is no difference between state and national sovereignty in a republic, the two mean the same thing, which then has the final doctrinal consequence that there is only one type of sovereignty in a republic. And that is why the most perfect form of government is the republic. Kalmar's formulation is strange and highly contestable. The, notice, the notion that national and state sovereignties overlap perfectly in theory in a republican polity seems untenable, not least because it doesn't allow for the existence of national minorities categorized in ethnic terms. <clears throat> but he was rather a publicist than a public intellectual, writing in Senta, in the Bachka, outside of the main intellectual and academic centers of the Kingdom of Hungary. But this text is a testament to, on the one hand, just how geographically dispersed Republican thought could be outside of the main urban centers. And on the other, that Republican thought could be expressed from below, by those who are not at all part of the canon and whose textual traces are comparatively limited. As stated, the existence of the countrywide Republican Party and its journal was short-lived. In June 1913, the Hungarian Minister of Justice, Janu Balaur, uh, proposed legislation which would make it a criminal offense to, quote, slander the king and the institutions of the kingdom. In his introduction of this piece of legislation, Balog specifically targeted the budding Republican movement and singled out Nodge's uh, uh, countrywide Republican Party. Indeed, this was a strategic choice. The party was marginal, small, and although it had excellent connections with the progressive intellectual and political life of the country, it was not the main representative of the growing and influential workers' movement nor the representative of the intelligentsia itself in Budapest. Largely limited in its influence, it could be easily marginalized. For procedural rules, the bill was read at three sessions of the lower house of representatives, the KP Surlohas, and meant no dissent. After its acceptance there, the bill was sent to the House of Lords, the Führendihas, where it was accepted by the unanimity of silence, no debate at all. At this point, on June 25th, 1913, it became law. It was made public a month later, in July 1913, announced in the government's organ for administrative decrees, the Budapesti Kozlon, and subsequently published as part of the Magyar Törvénytár, or the Hungarian Legal Corpus, as Act 34 of 1913. At that point, the Hungarian Republic was unable to publish its monthly issue in July, and the countrywide Republican Party dissolved. Thus, the use of openly Republican political language in the Kingdom of Hungary was essentially halted from June 1913 to October 1918, although certainly trends did survive through other pathways, and this is a common theme in the history of Republican political thought in this part of Europe. During the First World War, one does not register the pre-war frequency of appeals to Republican principles or the theorization of Republican politics. This can be attributed in part to the wartime situation, the use of emergency powers in the Austrian half of the monarchy, where, among other issues, political life came to a comparative standstill, and censorship of the press, particularly among the workers' movement, had intensified. Indeed, many went into exile or simply withdrew from public view. Those who were not politically active before the war, but who wound up in PO camps in Tsarist Russia, for example, became radicalized through their contacts with Bolshevik and other leftist forces on the eve of and during the February and October revolutions in 1917. Also during 1917, what has come to be known as the Declaration Movement began. 
the circulation of the May and Corfu declarations, signed in May and July 1917 respectively, spurred, South Slavic, spurred the South Slavic Republican left to consider the question of state form with much greater intensity than it had during the war. Retrospectively, the May and Corfu declarations have appeared as the key documents that specified the post-war aims of South Slavic politicians. A clear Republican counterpoint to these declarations did exist, though it was drafted and published abroad in Chicago. The Slovenian language Chicago, Chicago Declaration, the Shikashka Izjava, was drafted in June 1917, following the publication of the May Declaration, but only accepted in August 1917 after the Corfu Declaration had been signed at the inaugural General Assembly of the Slovenian Republican Association, Slovensko Republikčansko Združenje in Chicago. Its ranks were largely populated by Slovenian immigrants in America and Slovenian Americans, typically the second generation, many of whom had ties to the Socialist Party USA, and whose aim it was to agitate for a post-war federal Yugoslav state founded on Republican and democratic principles not unlike the American model. Those who drafted the declaration recognized that the political problems which had been generated among South Slavs up until the World War, above all, domination by foreign hegemonic political forces in their argumentation, necessitated the political um, unification of all territories where South Slavs lived. But the fact of distinct historical developments also required the preservation of certain political and cultural autonomies within the new state for each part of the Yugoslav nation, which in the Slovene Republicans uh, view com was comprised of Slovenes, Croats, Serbs, and Bulgarians. Thus, the national and state questions were bound up into a complex problem in need of a solution. Theirs was to declare support for a federal Yugoslav Republic. They argued firmly against annexation or the incorporation of South Slav territories into existing state structures, which is very similar to the arguments of the radical students around Republika in Belgrade a decade earlier. This placed the Slovene Republican Association against the provisions laid out in both the May and Corfu declarations. They argued that, and here's the quote, it is clear that such a new state formation cannot be anything other than a democratic republic. Creating a new monarchy at a time when the old ones are collapsing would place the Yugoslavs in a ridiculously sad position against the spirit of the times, against a victorious global democracy, and against their own needs. They continued, with the exception of a federal organization, which ensures each part so much independence that it will not have to fear any centralist oppression or pressure from the other parts, and which leaves closer association in the future to natural free development, we demand all the guarantees of a constitutional and democratic life in the Yugoslav Republic. The requirements that the signatories listed, among others, centered on universal, equal, secret, and proportional suffrage with, quote, without regard for gender, braz ozira naspol, full equality of citizens, complete freedom of speech in the press, freedom of instruction and conscience, and, quote, the neutrality of all authorities in class conflict. A little less than a year later, in October 1918, the Habsburg Empire collapsed. In part through external pressure, namely fundamental losses on the front, particularly to Italy in the later stages of the war, as well as the complete collapse of the provisioning system at home. Hunger raged across the empire, smuggling, price gouging, and black market activity increased, and deserting soldiers started to pull apart the social and institutional fabric of local societies which stood between them and wherever home was. Uh, this is also uh, sort of tied up with peasant revolts and the appearance of green cadres in the countryside. With the class of imperial state authority, the political vacuum was quickly filled by various workers, soldiers, and national councils spread all over the territory of the empire. Local societies reacted by taking power into their own hands in the interregnum that followed. Over the next year, this led to the declaration of numerous uh, mini-states on the territory of the empire, many of which declared themselves republics. The revolutions in Vienna and Budapest too created republican polities on territory claimed by the previous regime, but in, in effect only extended their administration to those territories which they could hold militarily. On November 12, 1918, following Karl I Habsburg's abandonment of participation in Austria's affairs, German Austria was declared a republic, with the Social Democrat Karl Renner as chancellor. Four days later, on November 16, 1918, the Hungarian National Council in Budapest declared a republic, headed by Mihai Karoy, with the influential assistance of the civic radical Oscar Yassi, 
and the participation of the former head of the countrywide Republican Party, George Nod. Here he is in the center. Yet the regional situation was unstable. After the new year in 1919, the Hungarian Republic quickly fell apart after the Karoi government could not guarantee the territorial integrity of historical Hungary. A backroom alliance forged between social democrats and communists in Budapest resulted in the formation of the Hungarian Republic of Councils in March 1919, and which infamously lasted for 133 days. In that period, a flurry of Republican texts were published on the political left up until the collapse of the Red Army against Entente-led Romanian, Royalist, Hungarian, Czechoslovak, and Yugoslav forces in summer 1919. The state falls apart in August. The following month, in September 1919, the Treaty of Saint-Germain came into effect, precluding the union of Austria with Germany, and so the creation of an independent Austrian Republic. By 1920, the state had a Republican democratic constitution drafted by Hans Kelsen. The Austrian interwar story of Republican political thought then became one of the legalistic debates, became one of legalistic debates over the form and function of a Republican state. While the initial political setup saw the oppositional camp rather situated around the political right, the Christian socials, the Bauernbund, and some small royalist factions, as the interwar period went on, the Social Democrats could only maintain their hegemony in Vienna, meaning that the Republican left could only exercise its politics as public policy at the municipal level. And so at this point, I leave the Austrian case to the side for the rest of the presentation because it sort of diverges uh, at this point in my research. Across the newly internationalized border in the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, an interim popular representation had been decreed by King Alexander I Karadjordanic. The legislative body first met in March 1919, with representatives placed in their positions through delegation rather than election. This anti-democratic move on behalf of the monarch created a flurry of harsh criticism in Republican circles. A year into their work, one of the heads of the newly founded Yugoslav Republican Party, Yasha Prodanovic, wrote that, quote, today's situation is worse than oligarchy and violence. It is a disgusting comedy that can only be put on by intellectually ill or morally rotten politicians. From such conditions, one either goes toward revolution or complete state collapse. As a party that wants evolution to change the form of government and reform our new state, we resolutely protest against strikes, use the term udari, of this kind, which are insane in ordinary circumstances, and today, when state unity is to be created, they are a crime. Uh, the reference to strikes here is rather tongue-in-cheek. The article was published on May Day, 1920. He's not referring to workers. He's referring to the government, which faced incredible instability leading up to the debates on the draft constitution. Constant dissolution of democratic and radical party controlled governments meant that the state itself could not properly function when it needed to and could not resolve the economic problems of post-imperial transition and could only create loyalty through the trading of positions and favors among the political elite. With the acceptance of the Yugoslav constitution on Vidovdan 1921, June 28, 1921, the opposition boycotted the vote, including the Republican forces around the communists, the Croatian Republican Peasant Party, and the Yugoslav Republican Party. The route toward a federal Yugoslav Republic was cut off. For the duration of the interwar period, the Republican left in Yugoslavia would fight an oppositional battle. This, per this was particularly successful for Stefan Radic's Croatian Republican Peasant Party, the Hrvatska Republikanska Sajačka Stranka, which adopted the Republican modifier during the wave of peasant unrest in 1918 and 1919, whose slogans often referenced a republic as a shorthand for land reform, mm -hmm. self-government, and in some cases, economic democracy. The Croatian Pe uh, Republican Peasant Party uh, had a series of agitational activities that took advantage of the situation, and coupled with their direct and simple political materials, as well as their extensive organization, they could reach many corners of the world. In April 1923, in the aftermath of that year's parliamentary elections, an extended poem was published in the party's main organ, Slobodny Dom, the free home of the free homeland. Running four half columns on the front page, the poem was written and sent in by a Croatian emigrant, Josip Leic, from <laughs> all places, Jerome, Arizona. Uh, according to passenger lists collected at Ellis Island and some other digitized documents that I've come across, Plejic was born in 1893 in Gorica, Herzegovina, directly west of Mostar uh, at the current Croatian border. 
His nationality was written down as Austrian in the American documents, but his declared quote-unquote race or people uh, was declared as Dalmatian. His last permanent residence from 1910 was in Tista, a small town in inland Dalmatia, north of Makarska and east of Split. Uh, here it is. That year, 1910, he left for the U.S. with his brother, Ante. They both described themselves as farm laborers and as literate, and stated that their final destination was Leadville, Colorado, where large mining and smelting operations existed at the time. You can imagine what they were mining and smelting in Leadville, Colorado. Uh, it seems that their emigration was largely of an economic nature, with Ante returning to his wife in Sista a number of times in the 1910s and 20s, and taking a final trip back to the U.S. in 1931. Yosip rather remained in the U.S. from 1910 onward and wound up in Jerome, Arizona. Here we go. Uh, so they came into New York City, Ellis Island, very classic route. Uh, this is a, it's a railway map, a contemporaneous railway map uh, from the late 1910s, early 1920s. Um, so you can see the sort of the, the density uh, of railway networks sort of opens up the further west you go. Uh, but what's interesting is that a lot of the nodes in the railway network are actually connected to mines. Uh, so here's Leadville, Colorado, and here is Jerome, Arizona. Uh, in case we're not familiar with the geography of Arizona, uh, which is where I'm from. <laughs> uh, here's Phoenix, the capital. This is where I'm from. Uh, Jerome is north uh, in the Verde Valley. Uh, and here's Flagstaff, and this is where Route 66 goes through. So in case you're familiar with the song, this is, this is where Flagstaff uh, is. Uh, okay, where are we? Uh, yes, as I said, so in Jerome, a large copper mine existed, and he was employed by the United Verde Copper Company. While in the U.S., uh, he must have received copies of Slobodny Dom, uh, or perhaps through other immigrant publications, he uh, remained informed about political developments in Yugoslavia. In his poem, which is here, uh, Pledge reacted to the elections of 1923 by praising Radic's leadership and called the, quote, defense of the republic, the duty of every Croat. Uh, I'm very sorry for this bad translation. It works much better in Croatian. Um, but here it goes. Now brothers, mothers, sons of the republic of the great Balkans, when the days of the election have passed, every Croat defends the republic. That, brothers, is now your duty to defend our homeland. A republic with freedom shines. Radic gives us a real lesson. Justice brings the day of liberation, which is our eternal desire. Um, in Croatian, it goes, Sada braccio, majčini sinovi, republike sivi, sokolovi, kad su prošli od izbora dani, svaki hrvat republiku brani, to je braccio, sada dužnost uh, vaša, da se brani domovina naša, republika sa slobodom sjaje, nama radić pravi naogdaje, pravda nosi dano slobodjenja, što je naša, Neprestana Zhelya. Uh, the poem is laudatory, uh, and it's really long, too, uh, and sees the establishment of a, quote, neutral public following the party line as a national imperative. With a simple poem, we can see just how far Republican political thought from the Danubian tradition could extend globally. And with some extra work, the political thought of a farm laborer turned copper miner can also be integrated into this story alongside that of much more visible public intellectuals. One wonders then about the extent to which Pleitch's vision of a republic was informed by his experiences in the United States, a deeply flawed but institutionally functioning republican model. The evocation of different republican models was a common feature of republican thought on the left. In 1923, the Serbian geologist and republican political thinker, Jovan Jujovic, provided an argument that the French Third Republic ought to be the model for a republic in Yugoslavia. On the pages of Republika, now republished in the interwar period also in Belgrade, as the organ of the Yugoslav uh, Republican Party, uh, this also included uh, references to Czechoslovakia, the United States, the Republican experiments in Portugal and Spain, as well as the Bolivarian Republican projects in South America. In Hungary, during the period of Mihai Karoly's first Hungarian Republic, the civic radical Oskar Yassi similarly proposed a reorganization of the former territories of the Kingdom of Hungary on the basis of the Swiss cantonal model. The negotiation of an ideal Republican state form in Danubian Europe was tied indeed to many different issues, not only the national one. Questions of democracy were paramount, and given that these thinkers did exist within largely agrarian economic contexts, 
the peasant or agrarian question was closely linked. It is to this end that common fronts could be created between various Republican camps, between Serbs and Croats, Croats and Slovenes. Uh, Albin Prepelu, who many of you might know, uh, Anton Movacan, for example, were both in contact with Stepan Radic, cooperating in different electoral and publishing arrangements. For example, Slobodny Dom published some issues of Novachan's Republika, the organ of his small Slovene Republican Party in the 1920s. Prepeluch and Radic shared the same electoral lists in 1925 and 1927, uh, listed in the Slovene parts of Yugoslavia as the Slovene Republican Party of Workers and Peasants. Uh, here are some of the electoral materials. This is from Prepelu's personal font here in Ljubljana. Uh, they agitated for Republican statehood, above all on the basis of wide enfranchisement, which would mean the overwhelming majority of the electorate would stem from agrarian backgrounds. Questions of land reform, regional autonomies, and local self-government thus became key parts of the negotiation between Republican socialist and agrarian political ideals. So you can sort of see that Republican political thought becomes... Uh, some sort of cross ideological framework where a lot of common positions could be negotiated, which otherwise uh, maybe wouldn't make sense if we sort of see these ideologies as more compartmentalized or closed off from one another. Uh, indeed, the agrarian Republican discourse could also point in populist directions. The Hungarian case of the Nemzeti Parast Part, or the Hungarian National Peasant Party, of the 1930s is an excellent case to compare with Radic's Croatian Republican Peasant Party. Hardly as influential as Radic's formation, the intellectual grouping around the National Peasant Party was strong. Istvan Bibo, Gyula Ilesh, and Ferenc Erdei were heavyweight thinkers, and their vision of agrarian socialism and the concomitant provision of radical land reform, the creation of small holdings and self-managed cooperatives, as well as the full democratization of political life pointed toward Republican ends although the word itself was not always present in their texts. The law against slandering the king and the institutions of the kingdom from 1913 was still in effect in revanchist post-revolutionary Hungary. And this was used as a threat by the right against many left-wing formations in the press, and it shaped the limits of possible open Republican discourse. With the advent of the January 6th dictatorship in Yugoslavia too, open Republican agitational discourses fell to the side. Instead, in an open dictatorship, in the authoritarian parliamentary system which followed, we can say this is the period between 1929 and 1941, the key concept republic was rather replaced by the key concept democracy. This can be observed best in the newspaper Napred za Narod, founded and edited by the chief legal and economic thinker of the Serbian Republicans, Mihailo Ilic. On the pages of Napred, Ilic and other contributors argued for the creation of a fully democratic political system. And given Ilic's sympathies to French solidarism, it is clear that democracy could be extended to the economic sphere too. These were continuations of the Republican discourse of the 1920, not only in personal terms, but also ideationally. These are sort of theoretical filaments which are coming back and forth uh, in these periods, albeit under a shifted textual form. However, after a few years of publication, the newspaper's work was halted with the Nazi-German-led invasion of Yugoslavia. Quickly afterward, in occupied Belgrade, Ilic and other intellectuals on the Republican left, including Jasha Pravanovic, uh, were rounded up by the Gestapo. They were interned in the concentration camp at Banica. Uh, and there, uh, Ilic died in 1944. Pravanovic survived, released in what seems like 1942, possibly also 1943. Uh, soon afterward, he joined the presidency of the Anti-Fascist Council for the National Liberation of Yugoslavia, known as Avnoi, uh, formally uh, as a representative of the Yugoslav Republican Party, though it's unclear to what extent a membership still existed. Thus, Prodanovic inserted himself into the provisional legislative arrangements of Avnoi, which was then transposed onto the workings of the interim government of the Democratic Federal Yugoslavia uh, in his role as minister for Serbia. His insistence on the reconstitution of Yugoslavia as a Republican state in part led to the declaration of Yugoslavia as a republic uh, in November 1945. After decades of agitation, Prodanovic's goal, and that of many other Republican thinkers, had been realized in Yugoslavia, a federal republic. Uh, this is not to gloss over the lack of political pluralism and its consequences for civil rights in the Yugoslav context 
nor for developments elsewhere in Danubian Europe after the Second World War. This study, rather, has tried to trace a series of different pathways and contexts in which Republican political thought was articulated in the first half of the 20th century, a continuation of intellectual traditions which were formed in the 19th. This form of political thinking achieved its most complex and nuanced articulations in this regional setting precisely because of its flexibility. It could be adapted by various ideological formations on the political left. This is the first conclusion. Such a mode of political thought created cross-ideological fertilization, which in turn should suggest to us that the study of individual ideologies and the parcelization of political camps is no longer enough in the history of political thought, and more widely in intellectual history at large. A second question relating to post-war developments could be posed like this. Does the realization of longer-term Republican goals in the region allow us another avenue by which we may reassess the post-war political and intellectual developments in Danubian Europe, or largely in East Central Europe? While liberal democracy was not realized in a normative Western European sense, this does not preclude the idea that different forms of democratization did occur, and occurred much earlier than the 1989 transition period. To what extent were these instances of democratization tied to the, deve to the development and realization of the Republican political tradition in this part of Europe. These are just some historiographic reflections made in light of my results and some small suggestions for how to reframe some aspects of contemporary historical research on the intellectual and political lives of this part of Europe during the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cody. It was very interesting and it, it shows how diverse this uh, republicanism was in, in this period and in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, geographical region, so to say. And now we came to the section of, of uh, questions. And this, of course, is also for... Uh, 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 valuable also for people online can they can write their question on the chat section and um, here too and i can already see i can already get first question okay. please at the back For the question, Thank maybe you. it would be good to answer. I think it's okay if we answer. Just to, yeah, okay. Do okay. it, and then we Great. see. Uh, okay, so this question of the relation between republicanism and social socialism is a really interesting one because, in some instances, you see that the political imaginary of what a socialist state looks like uh, is sometimes not defined by many socialist theorists. What's interesting is that you do get some sort of hints through more marginal texts. So for example, there's a, uh, 
a text by Karl Kautsky, which I think is published in Der Kampf, which is the theoretical journal of Austrian social democracy. And there he's actually writing about Southeastern Europe and how a sort of Balkan federation should be a union of Balkan Republican states. Uh, and it's sort of, on the one hand, you want to say, okay, it's, it makes sense. I mean, these socialists are clearly anti-monarchic. I mean, that's sort of maybe a default position in the ideology. But then on the other hand, in other contexts, like in Yugoslavia in the interwar period, you do have socialists like Živko Topalovic, who is a monarchist. He's a socialist and a monarchist. He sees no contradiction uh, because to some extent, it, you know, this, uh, uh, when you have a very dogmatic or at least uh, uh, very vulgar interpretation of the relations between base and superstructure, uh, to some extent, if you socialize the means of production at the base, then the superstructure, well, it's an epiphenomenon. So it doesn't matter if you have a king or if you have a sort of republic or a Soviet or something like this. Uh, and because of these actual positions which are taken, then, you know, to check the sort of theoretical assumptions, uh, I think then you, you get a sort of variety of positions. You can have socialists who are monarchists. You can have socialists who are openly republicans. Um, this question of neutrality in class conflict uh, which was part of the Chicago Declaration in 1917, these uh, Slovene immigrants uh, in the U.S. It's very interesting because to a certain extent, I think they, they see that this uh, Republican state form has to come first and then some sort of revolution can come afterward. So it actually is part of some sort of almost different non-Marxist evolutionary uh, view of history, which is a very interesting kind of, uh, let's say, uh, step away from a more classical understanding of how the sort of, you know, transitions through economic spheres uh, should work. Uh, on the other hand, you do see, so for example, in this, in 1921, in the debates around the draft constitution in Yugoslavia in particular, you do see some debates where like uh, Filip Filipovic, the sort of head of uh, uh, Yugoslav communists at the time, uh, is saying that a uh, socialist republic will be preferential to the toiling masses, as you put it. Uh, but we shouldn't worry because this is the majority of society. So the only people who will be excluded from the sort of political sphere are those who he defines as producing, uh, uh, or sort of unproductive is the word he uses in the economic sphere. And he specifically points out uh, those who are tied as, uh, to the military as officers, officers in the military, uh, and bankers, which is very interesting. Like he only takes two professional categories and says, These, this is actually unproductive. Everyone else is a worker. And, you know, so when we have a republic, everyone actually will be enfranchised except for these like 20 people uh, over here. Uh, I'm reducing it a little bit, but you see what I mean. Like there's there's some sort of preference, but the argument is that actually it's majoritarian. So you actually then fall back onto a more classical understanding of what a republican democracy would look like, even within a socialist communist even framing, because uh, the sort of uh, movement is bolshevized by that point. Uh, in Hungary, it's a little bit different. I mean... It's more present, let's say, in the 1870s and 1880s. You actually have a sort of tight understanding between the fact that as socialists, we should agitate for a republic, which is coming from precisely the sort of radical wing of the 1848 legacy. So it's not it's not the Kosciuk legacy, but it's the Mihai Tancic legacy, because at the time, Tancic was really writing about creating a republic uh, under socialist appearances. And then this is taken on by figures like Leo Frankel and different sort of key figures in the uh, Hungarian social democratic movement. Uh, this sort of, as I said, like by, by 1913, this is actually legally cut off. If you talk about a republic, you sort of, you have a criminal offense waiting for you. Uh, and so you see it less in the press. And rather you have discussion about democracy and suffrage and so on. And this becomes the sort of um, bread and butter of the social democratic movement. Um, but because of this earlier legacy, one can sort of see that, okay, this is actually a sort of form of self-censorship, uh, but actually given the tradition which exists in which they're constantly referencing, it's abundantly clear what's actually sort of there uh, in the background. Uh, okay, and then quickly about the People's Republic in Hungary. I don't know of any sort of particular, for example, inter-imperial connections between these political formations. Uh, I know, for example, that uh, on the May Day demonstrations in 1919, during the creation of the Hungarian Republic of Councils, there are sort of international demonstrations with the different international sections uh, who, are, who have been working in Budapest. So there was like a, there's a book that I found, which is literally just a picture book. You open the page and it, it's, you can imagine that there's one guy on the street with the camera on the tripod and he's taking a photo every time the international sign goes by. So it's the mm -hmm. same, it's just different people and different like languages on each of the signs as they go by. So you have Czechoslovak, uh, Romanian, Hungarian, German. Uh, I think you also have uh, Polish and Turkish. But I don't know of, for example, of any Ukrainian participation. Uh, 
So it, it's something to look into because I think it's really fascinating because many of these mini states were somehow also in contact through different personal relations. Um, but I, uh, for this one, I'm not so sure precisely. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't venture, I guess yet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Rook. So, um, if we rightly focus on the left, what about the right? I mean, this is not my topic, but I know of the Slovene People's Party, which was staunchly monarchic or loyalist mm -hmm. in the Catholic Empire, but as it collapsed, they became Republican mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they supported the Republic for a while. They, they, they were not happy about him. They were, eventually, they settled, but this was not their preferred solution, the, 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 new, the new kingdom. So, mm -hmm. so were there similar phenomena uh, elsewhere in, in the Slovenian basin? And how are these ideological or, or, or political connections? Where did these ideas come from? the uh, right yeah uh well i mean you're you're completely right in terms of the uh, slovene people's party i mean this is this is abundantly clear in the documentation that they have some sort of republican turn but because this is so short-lived and because it turns back into a politics of compromise with the status quo especially after the vidal dan uh then uh you sort of see that actually this is this is more of a knee-jerk reaction it's a sort of it's a quick opposition to try to make some sort of concessions to try to gain uh, more for this autonomous actually tradition that they have themselves. So it's more important in this case for the political right are some sort of traditions of regional autonomy or even national autonomy, uh, which can be negotiated with different uh, ideological positions, which are not necessarily coherent, but which are useful at a certain end. So it's much more pragmatic in that sense. And uh, I, th I think a fantastic example is, for example, in Croatia, the Stranka Prava. In 1919, they release a party program, which is like, uh, like Republikanski program uh, Stranka Prava, something like this. I mean, it's very basic, but you, but you look at it and really they're arguing from sort of, some sort of harsh Croatian right-wing exclusive like ethno-nationalist republic. Uh, and what's interesting is that uh, the one who formulates this is Ante Pavlic, who sort of precisely goes on and carries this sort of exclusivist Croatian nationalist tradition uh, precisely into the uh, creation of the Ustashe formations. Uh, and the resonance then on the political right uh, between this sort of early Republican option and uh, an Italian fascism, for example, when uh, these Ustashe formations are in emigration, uh, is something that I think is really under-researched, but is very interesting uh, about precisely how the sort of anti-monarchist position is actually emerging rather from some sort of Croatian nationalism because the dynasty is a Serbian one, something like this. Um, in Austria, like you have the Christian socials who are sort of wary, let's say, in, in many ways about the Republican setup, but nevertheless accept it. And so in that way, they go more the side of the Slovene People's Party and the sort of politics of acceptance. But instead of accepting the monarchy, they accept the Republic. But, you know, there's some sort of, um, let's say, compromises that are made within these political formations. Um, it's not to say that republicanism doesn't exist on the right. It's just that when it does appear, it seems to be much less theorized. It's much less complex. It isn't part of a sort of existent political tradition. So this is why I focus on the left is precisely because this is, we're talking about over a century of like theory building uh, within these different political movements. Okay, thank you for the answer. And any other questions here, maybe online? No. Okay, for oh, another question, Sapo, please. Yeah, it's, it's no one else, I was. Uh -huh. uh, so I have a question. Um, I have a question about concrete ideas about the institutional design of republic. Uh -huh. So you mentioned uh, the reference of the French experience. I'm especially interested um, in the relations uh, between a parliament, well, I mean, the universal elections is pretty clear with the Bosnian organization, but what about presidents? So the most presidency of such a republic is Charles de Gaulle, uh, and if it was, uh, was there any um, kind of <coughs> about strong presidency? And I mean, this applies mm. not only to the intellectuals who were active in the recent spell, but also to the emigre communities that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, was the experience <coughs> of the United States in the <coughs> to presidency? In the mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a really uh, wide-ranging debate, for example, on centralism versus federalism in the Yugoslav case. Uh, this is a really short-lived debate, but it exists in the Hungarian one. Uh, and the sort of consensus-building politics in Czechoslovakia, for example, are really based around some sort of French model, actually, with a strong presidency and then some sort of managed parliamentary system, uh, which is abundantly clear with this sort of development of the Pietka in, in, the Czech, in towards Czechoslovakia. So, I mean, you really, it's fully managed. Uh, uh, in in Austria, for example, this is divergent. I mean, they're sort of going with uh, a, a sort of ger Germanic, let's say, parliamentary traditions. They're looking at the Weimar case and sort of having this negotiation back and forth. Uh, and so in, in that sense, you have these different institutional designs which have different levels of autonomy built into the system. And then these become points of debate about what regional differences uh, are allowed, which should be erased through centralism, um, and I mean, there's a certain amount of historiography that exists on this. So this is not my own sort of original finding or anything like that. I mean, this is just some sort of uh, synthesis of, of what exists in the literature already. But what's interesting is this question of models, of other models that you, uh, that you bring up, because this, I think, is less referenced. But, you know, for example, in the newspapers uh, with, with the Serbian liberals, uh, liberal Republicans around the Yugoslav Republican Party, they're sort of arguing that, you know, for example, we should have a president. An elected president, we should have parliament, which is, you know, uh, elected. And Yasha Prodanovich even goes into the sort of deeper, I don't know, backwoods of democratic theory and argues that uh, imperative mandates should be part of the system, which is something that is not really part of the mainline discussions, at least I found in any other sources, and which still today is like, you know, in, in uh, as part of like the, I think one of the entry requirements to be you know, a member of the European Union, you have to preclude imperative mandates from your constitutional system. It's, it's one of these like issues that keeps getting brought up at the European Court of Justice, for example, you know, to sort of eliminate uh, any sort of recall mechanism for representatives. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, just it, it goes into the, some, some, some more of the finer details, let's say, of these texts which exist. So some are published in newspapers, others are pamphlets, others are sort of longer like essays and theoretical journals and so on. Um, in the Serbian case, there's a good one called Buktinja. This is like a series public ser serial publication. It's more of a theoretical journal of the Republican left. Um, so let's say that these these debates about the institutional setup were, were were very visible. It's just that to a to a certain point, you have to figure out whether these are where to look. Let's say whether these are oppositional political journals, uh, which is the case in Hungary and Yugoslavia, or whether these are sort of you know the debates that legal scholars are having between each other in their own academic works, which is the, like the Austrian and the Czechoslovak case. So those, those are the sort of differences in where the debates lie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, questions? Another? Maybe I have for the last okay. Okay. question yeah. one. Uh, maybe uh, it's very maybe slightly provocative. But I can see all the diversity of republicanism um, that we have seen here. It's it's very very interesting from the various point of view. But uh, is could we place could we define republicanism as an ideology in this kind of mm. really typical sense mm. with a set of system of beliefs that it has certain templates its own logic or it's more of a um, principle that can be used by various ideologies i have a feeling that the, the answer in this this question is not quite simple because mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. either one or the other but maybe, what, what can you say about it yeah yeah uh, i mean this is something that i struggle with precisely in the like you know theoretical methodological grounding of how i look at these texts should i read them as part of a you know an ideological corpus which exists uh, or do i see these as you know sort of tactical rhetorical maneuvers in certain debates which are contextualized in certain discourses uh, which are not full ideologies uh, or as you say uh, principles uh, political principles in, in my thoughts, so I, I sort of hedge my bets in my text that I write. I typically don't actually use the word republicanism mm -hmm. uh, in a sort of, you know, in the sense of like a fully fledged ideology, uh, but rather I talk about Republican political thought or Republican political discourses. It's like a sort of modifier of a certain type of political discourse, which focuses on, uh, you know, sort of a specific private civic ethos. Um, you know, uh, different particular institutions of democratic self-government, 
uh, the idea that you actually have constitutionally ensconced the word republic as referring to the state form in which you live, uh, things like this. Uh, for some authors, though, it seems like this is a fully fledged ideology. It's something that they yeah. carry with themselves and they really blow it out into a complete system of beliefs, which is actually organizing how they are seeing the sort of world of social facts out there in the moment in which they're writing. Uh, Yasha Pradanovich is a good example of this. At a certain point, I realized that Stepan Radic is actually having this. So in some texts, you sort of wonder whether the agrarian peasantist side is actually subverted to the Republican one, precisely because in certain moments of opposition, it makes more sense to take on this sort of anti-monarchist position. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, for example, this, this not good in the, in the Hungarian case is also a good example of where an entire political personality is built around Republican principles. I mean, the entire movement, even if it only exists for two years, uh, is completely founded on republicanism as like a sort of fully formed ideology. Or if not fully formed, they're trying to actively to form it as an ideology. And that sort of that act of ideology making is something that's very interesting because it stands on this threshold between fully fledged thick ideology like liberalism or socialism, or you know, just some sort of side-handed political discourse that is more or less marginal. And so I think that the project that I'm trying to construct is to show that you know there are, there are more hegemonic ideologies, but republicanism is somehow in this liminal space where it exists, you see it all the time in the sources. Like in this picture, we have a massive sign here on the 1st of May demonstrations. This is in Torboja in, in, I think, 1919. Yeah, Julie Pergin-Mai. Along with the Socialist Republic. And this is, they're, they're not just slogans though, because this is put in a textual mm -hmm. arrangement of more theoretical texts too, which are linked to this sort of movement. So the fact that you can have masses of people out there and they're using this slogan also shows a certain level, even if it's very basic, of theoretical reflection. And it's not just the work of intellectuals. And so at that point, one has to question whether this is just some sort of marginal phenomenon or whether it's a fully fledged ideology. Well, I, well I, as much as I can see it, it's also the way, you have, uh, it's also by your studies, it's also the way in research how we can how we can approach a phenomena like this, which, which which are in liminal space between ideologies, principles, and uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this uh, I find that very interesting. And another thing, if I can conclude now, is interesting what your perspective means for for uh, scholarship called Slovenian historiography, because you've mentioned authors that in 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 Slovenian historiography. Are very well known, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, they're completely differently fra framed, and it shows really different perspective. Mm -hmm. And now I think the uh, Rockstergar has another question. Okay, Just one thing that I started thinking about: uh, why, what are, I mean, you mentioned the United States, mm -hmm. States as a kind of a role model. Mm -hmm. uh, do the United States? I mean, they entered this space in. And they were in public, mm -hmm. and they had a president who was not willing to, to transform the part of Europe. Yeah. Did they ever promote parliamentarism as a form of government in a mm -hmm. systematic way? Uh -huh. uh, I mean, the, the, the government or uh, organizations coming from the US, not, not this entry mm -hmm. uh, organization, but proper. Mm -hmm. As they do now, for example, I mean, you have all, all yeah. the sorts of these groups that try to come up with a certain vision of, of democracy. Mm -hmm. Was that happening then? Um, it's really, I mean, so I tried to look for this once, for example, in the uh, sort of historiography on the American Relief Association. Because my thought is okay, in this sort of open moment when you have a collapse of a massive state and you have to provide food, should it come with conditions? You know, are you giving the food to everyone? Are you giving the supplies and the clothing and so on to just anyone? Uh, and it turns out that uh, actually the sort of republic as a keyword is not really part of this package. To some extent, there is diplomatic pressure rather in Paris of the treaty making organization. So you do have provision, for example, of some uh, of relief kind of all over the region at different levels. So clearly they're having preferences, for example, for the, for the, for the allies uh, that were on their side. Uh, so there's less relief, for example, going to Hungary. Uh, and this is causing a lot of the internal issues uh, also. 
in a comparative sense. I don't want to speak in absolutes here. But um, it seems that actually there, there is in some diplomatic documentation uh, some sort of preference, like in this greens versus whites uh, controversy in, in Montenegro about the sort of, you know, who, who should be, uh, uh, you know, making the decision about whether we unite with Serbia and the, therefore Yugoslavia and so on. Uh, it seems that uh, there, there's like an American diplomatic representation and the guy sending back the reports seems to be saying that, well, we should prefer the Greens, if I remember correctly, who are on the side of creating a sort of Montenegrin Republic, precisely because it fits our vision uh, internationally uh, of, uh, of how we want to sort of see the international system itself. Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a sort of, uh, it's an open question. Let's say I think that this is still this is one of these aspects which is really uh, under research. But as far as I could tell, in sort of existing historiography on American intervention into the region and the sort of you know different collections like like the Inquiry, which is all digitized through the uh, uh, American National Archives, there's not so much material on this. They're collecting documents from some of the emigres, but this is rather going into the folder and they're writing a simple report, and it doesn't seem to be, for example, informing diplomatic decisions or you know decisions in the international sphere. Um, but it's more research to do, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, ideas, comments? If mm -hmm. please, please. This is very wrongly. And to follow up on what Marco was uh, saying about contribution to historiography, can you just talk a bit more? I mean, you finished with that. How, how is your contribution to national and transnational historiography? And maybe one more side note kind of connected to it and connected to what even I was asking about social democrats and uh, and republicanism. You mentioned then the example of Mirko Topalovic, mm -hmm. and then here in the presentation we were discussing a lot of like Slovenian social democracy. So, mm -hmm. and, like in terms of contribution, I was wondering whether what you're doing can help us understand better the differences between different social democratic ideas, for instance, in Serbia, uh -huh. Slovenia, or or if this is like too uh, trash somehow. Like, but if you would think in that direction, it would be useful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't include more Serbian social democrats uh, because uh, because this is really a fascinating like intellectual world to get into, and its links, for example, to German social democracy are sometimes determining how they're reflexively thinking about their own position uh, when they sort of envision a sort of like Balkan Balkan federation for themselves. Uh, and I, th I mean, in the dissertation itself, this is something that I have to make sure to emphasize are the different variations of social democracies. For example, the Yugoslav Social Democratic Party, which is headed mostly by Slovenes, is part of a federalist social democratic structure on the Austrian side of the monarchy. So they're linked, for example, to the Czech uh, and to the uh, German speaking Austrian uh, social democratic camps, even through organizational structures. Uh, and to a certain extent, this is also. Uh, you know, creating a certain, I don't know, um, transmission of common ideas about, uh, about these issues. Uh, then on the other hand, uh, what I, the sort of contribution that I want to make is to make visible, let's say, some of the sub-debates -debate, about, uh, you know, an intellectual history of theories of state, something like this. Uh, because on the socialist left, it's not always so clear that actually they have a coherent theory of what a state is. And so I think precisely to explore different debates within different national social democracies, but also the international connections, uh, particularly the interwar period, when you have a sort of fragmentation of the international. Uh, this could be a sort of really interesting project. Um, and if I were to make a sort of contribution uh, in that direction, it would be to highlight what the theories of state are in detail. That it's not simply just that, okay, we have Soviet Union, now we want Soviet Union at home, because it's never so simple. And that actually there's a lot of debate uh, and sort of negotiation about what this model would look like. Um, so that's, let's say that's how I envision one contribution. Uh, but, but the big one for this is I, my suggestion is just that, you know, different, um, different aspects of political languages, which are touching different ideological formations, which are really well canonized, can somehow also help us to rethink the extent to which socialism bleeds into agrarianism or the extent to which liberalism is actually sharing a lot of the same uh, conceptions of society and the state as socialists, something like this. Uh, 
And it, it can even start to frame further studies which are not about this topic. Like I was thinking about, um, for example, how the agrarian question is addressed by different political camps and actually how this is a sort of point of debate around which a lot of texts circulate and all of them are sort of addressing a common point, but is there some sort of ideological phasing between them? Like at, at a certain point, can you really tell who the leftists and the rightists and who the liberals and who the whoever are uh, in a certain debate if they're talking all about one topic? Uh, and another one that I sort of think about sometimes is this uh, corporativism as a sort of alternative economic model, which is neither capitalist nor socialist, because this is also a big debate, particularly in the 1930s. And I think that it's not well canonized at all, not even in the Italian case. It's, it's not particularly well canonized, uh, as I can see, just I don't read Italian, but just, just looking through the sort of, you know, different bibliographies and online materials and it's non-existent uh, in this part of Europe. And yet the texts are there as primary sources. So this there are projects that sort of emerge through this kind of looking, trying to look between the different ideological frames, which I think is, I don't know, it's a sort of fun exercise at the very least. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. And, and it's it's really exciting to, to, to think about that in completely different terms and to, to see different different approaches, not just approaches, to see the, the <coughs> this kind of uh, those um, republic as something as something that you can approach also different different phenomena, which of course it's it's very crucial regarding that it's so heterogeneously mm -hmm. implemented, and um, if there are no questions, I think I will slowly conclude maybe with this uh, with, with this thought that uh, that we are looking forward to your work. And that we are looking forward to your future book, of course, <laughs> which of course will be canonized. You gotta wait. You gotta wait a long time. I think. We will wait. We have time. We are historians, and oh God. we're used to that. And times fly. And uh, so, and thank you all for the audience here online for this first, first, um, first lecture of the series. And you will be notified about the next. And we are slightly mysterious about it, but we, we are working on it. And uh, eventually we will also be notified about the timeline of others. And just stay tuned uh, and please uh, just uh, stay alert and um, follow us on, on Twitter, at Facebook, and, um, and also visit us here at Spitza Live. Welcome. Thank you very much. Bye.